Welcome to everybody. And I will ask, unless you're going to talk, it helps if everybody will mute themselves. It keeps down on the background noise. I'm um, nice to see everybody. And those I don't know, I hope to someday get to know and meet you in a person to person. That's a dream in our future. I'm Terry Helton. I am Tim Helton's wife and um, co we're co-chairs of the Ventura County Interfaith Community. And we'd like to welcome you to this evening. And I would like to put a plug in that the best way to keep informed about the forums that we're doing and future forums is to visit vcic.info. That's vcic.info. And on the front page of our website, you will find a link where you can sign up for our email list. And then what I'm going to do, so you can have an idea of where we have come with this, I am going to show you a flyer. Can everybody see this flyer? And if you'll look, you'll see that's the a direct link to a website when we send this out. It will be in a PDF and you should be able to use it or you can type it into your browser. But notice this little thing in the corner here? That's a QR code. That's, um, can I actually did it on the computer and held my phone up with the QR reader and it took me to the website. So we keep moving into the new century. We might be 20 years late, but we're getting there. So I wanted to share that. And then um, I just wanted to remind you, we are recording the forums so that you can find them on the vcic.info website. And at the end of this forum, we will have a question and answer time. And questions may be submitted via the chat facility, which is on the bottom of your screen. It says chat, there's a little box. And you can access it by hovering your cursor over it at the bottom of the screen and then direct your questions to me. There'll be a drop down box that you can look for my name. And if you'll direct the questions to me, that would be a, a helpful thing. And then also in that chat box at the end of the program, there's going to be a survey link. And we would appreciate it if you would follow that link and complete it so we know how we're doing. Any questions on that? Okay. So it is my pleasure to take care of this bio tonight um, because this is one of my, this is my favorite person in the world. So Tim Helton holds a PhD and a master's of science from Drew University where he specialized in anthropology of religion and has an MA in theological studies from Claremont School of Theology. Tim's academic interests include comparative theology, Jainism and Hinduism. He is a founding member of the Ventura County Interfaith Community and a member of Campus Interfaith. He has done field work amongst Jains in the United States as well as in India, both independently and in conjunction with the 2005 and 2009 International Summer School of Jain Studies. His dissertation compared the attitudes and their theological underpinnings towards consumerism amongst Jains and Christians. Most important of anything from this that you need to know is that he is my husband and of 46 years and my boyfriend and soulmate for 47 years. So I would like to introduce Tim Helton right now. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, I just want to begin I can get control of this thing again. I want to begin by playing you the Namakar mantra. And um, it's when you attend a Jane um, event of any kind, this is a little like the Star Spangled Banner. They play it always uh, at the beginning of a uh, whatever event they're holding. And uh, this will give you an idea of some of the music that they they have. So we'll start with the Namakar Mantra and um, 
Let's see. Okay, he practiced this not half hour ago. You good, honey? Is it not coming across? Mm -mm. I'm sorry. You're not up at um, all. I'm sorry. Let, give me just a second and we'll figure this out. There we go. Namo Namo Arihanta give you just a taste of what it would sound like if you were at a Jain meeting in India or in the United States in the Jain diaspora. Uh, you would hear something very much like that at the beginning and sometimes as a special uh, number uh, played throughout the, um, throughout the event. Jainism dates from the 6th century BCE. It was founded by a man named Mahavir, or at least this is the story that scholars tell. James will tell you that Mahavir was uh, the 24th of uh, the, the final of 24 Tirtankaras. Tirtankaras means those who have forded the stream. And so he was the 24th of those who had forded the stream um, in his era. They would argue that Jainism is an eternal religion and that it goes back time immemorial. But scholars point to the contemporary of the Buddha, Mahavir, as the founder of the Jain religion. And he lived in about the sixth century BCE. You can actually read uh, a text or two in Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist texts that talk about uh, the Jain religion. And you can read uh, Jains that uh, uh, argue with the, the Buddhist religion. The name Mahavir, uh, means the conquering one, and he was a Jina, which uh, means the victor. There's a story told about the birth of Mahavira that is particularly informative. As he was um, in the womb, his mother had 14 auspicious dreams, and uh, she knew that she was pregnant with somebody who would one day be a... Um, He would one day, she, my wife just walked in and said, don't forget to change slides. Uh, he uh, would be uh, a, uh, a special uh, envoy from the gods to, um, to humans. And so she knew she was pregnant with this special being. But um, as the pregnancy progressed, she could feel no movement in the womb. And that was because Mahavir was such a gentle soul that he did not want to disturb his mother by kicking in the womb. 
But Mahavir, and so she became quite concerned about this and thought maybe she had lost the baby. And when Mahavir understood this, he kicked just gently enough so that his mother would know that he's alive and um, uh, would, would cease her worrying. We want to um, do several polls uh, during this presentation. So I'm gonna ask you to listen carefully. And our first poll will give you a chance to uh, describe what you've learned so far. And um, so you should see the poll on your screen right now. And if you can answer uh, which one of those is the correct answer, and you all get 100%, all two of you, we'll give you some more chance to weigh in. All right, you're listening very carefully. Give you just a minute more. And Mahavir is, was the founder of Jainism then. Um, and there are the results of the poll. We'll close that out and continue. Jainism posits a universe of a four part universe. And they say that the universe looks like a human being. And this is the shape of the universe with, you can see the arms uh, akimbo with the hands on the hips down here and the legs reaching out. And there are several symbols that, that are in this that I want to um, point out to you uh, to, so that you know, understand a little bit about Jainism. The bottom region is called the hellish region. In between the bottom and the top are the earthly region. In and above that is the heavenly region. And above that is what's called the Siddha realm. And Siddha is where people go once they've been completely enlightened on their final death. So Jains believe in reincarnation and they believe that they, the goal of life is to escape reincarnation. And once you have successfully escaped reincarnation, you will join the Siddha realm, which is represented by this upturned crescent. Um, this particular uh, drawing is the drawing that uh, all Jains have agreed to accept. There are several different uh, sects of Jains, two in particular, and but they've all agreed that this would represent their religion. You'll see the swastika here, and the swastika is different than the German swastika in a couple of, uh, a couple of important ways. One is that its arms go the opposite direction of the German swastika, um, there is a relationship between the German swastika and the Jain and Hindu swastika. You also see this in Hinduism. And if you would like to know more about the relationship between these two swastikas, put it in the, Q the chat and uh, I'll come back to that in the Q&A section. But the four arms of the, it also differs in relationship to the German swastika in that the four arms represent something very specific. They represent the four kinds of beings that um, inhabit the universe. There are beings who live in the hellish realm. There are beings who live, human beings, who live in the, the uh, earthly region. And then there are heavenly beings that live in the hev heavenly realms. And if you're counting carefully, you'll realize that that's only three. The third, the fourth um, type of being is the animal and uh, plant beings, the flora and the fauna that live in the earthly re region. Jains believe that, um, that you can be reincarnated either as a human being or as an animal or a plant or into the heavenly and the hellish regions. They insist that six substances make up the Jain universe. The first one is ajivas or the material world. And in that material world are matter, including karma. So car uh, Jainism is a little unique in that matter, that karma is actually a material substance. Space is a material substance. Time is a material substance. 
the medium of motion or what we would call, um, now the word slips my mind, um, when something is set to moving and continues to move, and then the medium of rest, the resistance in which something eventually comes to a rest. So these are the five kinds of, um, of material. And then they believe that there are also living beings in the world. And these living beings are peers with one another. So they all have at their core a self that has to liberate itself from the continual cycle of birth and death. And these beings include plants, animals, people, obviously. The earth is a living being with a self in the Jain cosmology. Fire, water, and air are all living beings in the Jain cosmology. Karma, as I pointed out just a moment ago, is one of the substances. And for Jains, karma ties one to samsara. Samsara is a cycle of suffering, death, and rebirth. So it's a cycle of reincarnation. And for Jains, karma is a material substance that is attracted by violence and adheres to the soul like trash to an unswept, unswept street. One must eliminate both good karma and bad karma to achieve liberation. Jains believe that one is embodied because one is bound to the cycle of samsara, or again, the cycle of birth, suffering, death, and rebirth. So in samsara, a bondage of, in samsara, they believe in samsara or bondage of jivas to a cycle of death and rebirth. In material karma, which pollutes the jiva and binds them to the cycle of reincarnation or samsara, that action attracts and that that action and attracts and passions dis like desire bind the karma to the soul, and that the elimination of karma and thus the suppression or the elimination of passion that leads to the elimination of karma is uh, required for one to be liberated. There are three core values in Jainism. If you don't get anything else from this talk tonight, I hope you'll remember these three core values because in my mind, these are the most powerful aspect of, uh, aspect of Jainism. First of all, they believe in what's called ahinsa or nonviolence. Jains derive their central ethic, ahimsa, or nonviolence, from the idea that all jivas, all living beings, have a right to live unmolested. I chose this particular picture to represent ahimsa because those of us in the Abrahamic tradition will recognize this notion of an ox weaning a lion and a lion weaning a, uh, a, a cow. So... Um, Ahinsa is the notion that nonviolence is important because all jivas have a right to live unmolested. In light of this ethic, Jains take great care to avoid unnecessary harm to living things. They practice lacto-vegetarianism. That is, they drink milk and they eat plants, but they do not eat meat. And uh, beyond that, they also do a number of things to avoid harming the other li uh, living beings. This monk here is wearing a mask, not because he's in COVID, but because he is um, protecting the air from his voice. So he believes that his voice is violent enough that when he talks, he would actually harm the air. And so in order to avoid that, he wears a mask. They carefully screen water to avoid harming microbes that live in the water. And they support charities that alleviate suffering, both human and su suffering, both human and animal. Here you have a picture of one of the world's largest prosthetic plants. Um, th this man is making a leg for somebody who probably who lost a uh, leg in a train accident. And this is one of the things that Jane's um, support. 
Ahissa, in turn, impl implies the Jain value of a parigra. A parigra is the voluntary limit of one's consumption and the suppression of attachment to that which one owns. Jain monastics manifest the concept to which this word refers in its extreme form by renouncing all but the most basic possessions. Believing that consumption and possession are inherently violent, monks and nuns of the Svetambara white clad sect, for example, renounce all possessions other than a dozen or so personal necessities. Monks of the other major Jain sect, the Digambara or sky clad sect, further reduce these possessions to sacred texts, a pot of water, and a broom for gently clearing insects from their paths. And we indeed, one of the greatest di differences between these two sects is the difference in belief as to whether monks should wear clothing. Svetambaras wear a simple, long white cloth and the Gambaras monks wear no clothing at all. Because a parigra finds its motivation in nonviolence, its influence extends to consumption as well as to possession so that monastics from both sects set careful limitations on their appetites. Both monastic communities obtain their food by begging. The Tambara monks and nuns use begging bowls to accumulate food, while the Gambara monks accumulate food only in their outstretched hands. And um, ad additionally, Jaini urges, Jainism urges the laity of both sects to practice a potty gras, albeit with less rigor. Umasvati did you forget a slide, sweetheart? I did. No, I'm still on a potty gras. Okay, I thought you had a picture of the monks. Okay. No, that comes later. Umasvati, a fifth century monk, described the lay practice of a potty gras as one of keeping within the set limits of possessions, a description that Padmanabh Jaini interprets to mean that properly observant lay Jains set limits on what they may own. I think of all of the uh, aspects of Jainism, this is such an, an interesting one for our consumer society because Jains, at least in theory, uh, limit what they possess and set limits and uh, beyond those, sometimes those limits are, are, are rather grandiose but they do consciously say, I won't have more money than this amount of money. I won't have more. I knew a man in, um, I think it was in indoor India, who said, I only have six pairs of pants because I only need six pairs of pants and only a cup and only six shirts because I only need six shirts. The final value that Jains hold in their core values is the value of anekantvad. Ahimsa also implies anekantvad, affirming the validity of the perspectives of others. This means that for some, all religions are the same, for some Jains. For other Jains, it means that all religions are Jainism. But the basic notion is what is Gandhi gave, I think, the best expression of what the basic notion is. He said, I am always true from my own point of view, and I'm often wrong from the point of view of my honest critics. We are both right from our respective points of view. Gandhi was not a Jain, but he was heavily influenced, as was Martin Luther King Jr., by Jain um, um, values. And you can see this in both men's works, both in their uh, reluctance to be violent, their, their refusal to uh, engage in violent pr pr uh, protests. You can see it in uh, both, both men in the voluntary poverty. Um, it's said that um, uh, Jay, um, Gandhi, of course, was well known for having a very limited number of positions. And it's said that Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife differed because Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to reduce his possessions. And then again, you can see this in their practice of this important virtue of Anikant Vada, in which, um, again, they uh, had to respect and held in high respect 
the viewpoints of others, including those with whom they differed. Jainism's posit, in order to escape this uh, samsara, this uh, bondage to birth, suffering, and death, they advocate a um, 14 steps to liberation. The steps of liberation can be vision envisioned as though they were uh, rungs on a ladder leading to spiritual development. Person may require many lifetimes to fully entrance at these stages. And interestingly, um, interestingly, those lifetimes may or may not be human lifetimes. I remember one time sitting in a Jane lecture and the Jane monk became almost evangelical as he said, you are, in, you are born as a human. This is the only time that you have where you can embrace Jainism. So embrace Jainism now because you don't know what your next uh, stage of life will be. The steps to liberation include, first of all, ignorance. And that's where all of us were before we joined this, this, uh, this uh, forum tonight. Lingering ignorance is a uh, step that you can fall back on to. Normally you skip from step number one through step number three. By the way, shoots and ladders uh, was modeled after uh, the Indian um, discussion of uh, the steps to liberation. And one of those um, uh, 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 plans of liberation was the Jane plan. So you go from ignorance to, your, to mixed truth and ignorance. And so if you're just now hearing about Jainism, you've already moved to stage number three and you're, in the, you're on the path to liberation. The fourth gunasthana or the first stage, the fourth stage is the first full glimpse of truth followed by partial renunciation. Depending on how successful you are in partial renunciation, you may fall back to, J to step number three or step number two. The sixth step, however, is one in which you take monastic vows. And there are five monastic vows, nonviolence, truthfulness, non-theft, celibacy, and non-possessiveness. These are, by the way, exactly the same vows that uh, Hindus undertake in their uh, uh, search for liberation. So once you've uh, become a monastic, um, you undertake these five vows. Then you climb the remaining um, eight steps of the ladder from complete renunciation to a meditative state where you live in sort of a state of constant uh, meditation to advanced meditation to a state where your passions begin to wane. Your desires become have less of a hold on you to quieted passions and then to a passionless state. The 13th stage is the stage in which the Tirtanka or the liberated being to be uh, achieves omniscience. And the 14th state is where the Tirtankara achieves Siddha, a state that's sometimes defined as complete passivity and sometimes as complete solitude. Of all of the uh, aspects of Jainism, this was what disturbed the Western students the most when I studied with them in India, this notion that you are totally removed from all other beings and from the material universe and you live in a place of complete equanimity and complete peacefulness. I want to skip that slide out of deference to time. Monastics and Tirtankras, um, you'll see here that a picture depicting the life of a Tirtankra or a liberated being. They begin by renouncing uh, their um, their clothing and their, uh, if you're Digambara, their clothing, if you're Smitambara, their other possessions. And you'll see this man's hand is pulling at his hair right there. 
And that's because they will pull the hair out of their head. And the reason that they do that is so that they don't leave a place where lice can grow and be, um, and be, in, be harmed uh, in the top of their head. So they, they renounce. From renunciation, they begin a life of begging. This Tirtankara, this is the Digambara Tirtankara receiving a meal in his hands. They spend much of their time in meditation and austerities, but they also spend their time teaching. And then at the end of their life, if they have lived a sufficiently passionless life, they reach enlightenment and uh, are never born again into the cycles of samsara. You see the difference between the, I mentioned two sects of the, of the uh, Jains. One is the Digambara sect, which believes that the Tirtankaras renounce clothing, and while the Svatambara sect believe that they did not. You see, in, if you look, if you happen to get a chance to visit a Jain temple and look at the iconography, you can tell whether you're in a Svetambara uh, temple or a Digambara temple, because in the Svetambara temple, the images have clothing and the, in the Digambara temple, the images do not. You can also tell the difference. Again, uh, here we have a Svetambara monk who's wearing a white cloth and he's begging with begging bowls. This is a Digambara monk. He's wearing no clothes. And if he were to be begging, he would be begging with his open hands. Svetambras, uh, there are doctrinal differences amongst Svetambras and Digambras. Svetambras believe that women can reach Siddha. Digambras believe that women must reincarnate as men be achieve, before achieving the final goal. Since again, you have to be able to go about without clothes as a final act of renunciation if you're a Digambara. And you ask a Digambara, well, why uh, can't women go without clothes? And they say, well, it would uh, disturb society too much if they did. The lay community provides, th there's a symbiosis between the lay and the monastic community. Um, the lay community provides boiled water and food that they would have consumed. And the monastics provide counsel, teaching, and good karma to the uh, lay community. I want to end this presentation by telling you the story of a Jain policeman that we, um, we met when we were in India. In Delhi, um, one, somebody who was high up in the police force came and he addressed our group and he told us, this is how I practice my Jainism. The first thing he said was, whenever I draw my gun or my stick, I have to promise myself, I have to assure myself that whatever I do will cause less harm than what's happening um, around me now. So he, if he draws his gun, he says, I have to draw the gun and will doing so cause less harm than if I don't draw my gun. My gun. So he practices ahimsa in that way. He practices a pas de gras, he said, because he a asks himself whether he would be willing. He came from a village as a very poor young man. And he says, am I willing to go back to the village faced with the corruption that's rampant in the Indian uh, police force? Um, can I willingly go back to the village? And he answers, yes, I can willingly go back to the village. And if my superiors demand that I be behave in, in a corrupt manner, then I'm ready to go back to the village rather than uh, experience that corruption. And on Kant Vlad, he, has, he says when he settles a dispute, he has to see all sides of the question. He has to understand both the perpetrator's um, uh, state of mind, and he has to understand the um, police for the, uh, the victim's state of mind in order to be able to uh, mediate a dispute. So there you have Jainism in uh, about 40 minutes, and I'll turn it over to Terry to uh, uh, ask some, to, add, to pose some questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. 
You gonna stop sharing, sweetheart? I am. There we go. Thank you. That was a good review. I'm still gonna be squashing those silverfish. Um, so one of the first questions, I actually wrote it down and then somebody put it in there too, was what's the diff uh, what are the differences in the swast swastikas, um, the Jane connection between the German and the um, Jane So the swastika. differences are, as I said, um, the, the arms of the swastika go in different directions and the swastika in Jainism represents the four types of living beings, hellish beings, heavenly beings, humans, and the animal and plant kingdom. Um, the connection between the Jains, the Indian swastika, let's put it that way, since, um, uh, since um, it's a Hindu symbol as well as a Jain symbol, it, this connection between the two is that during the Hitler's reign, there was an idea popular that those who had written the Indian scriptures were light-skinned and had conquered the dark-skinned Indians. And Hitler adopted that swastika as a way of associating himself. They were called Aryans, the light-skinned uh, Indo-Europeans that uh, they then believed had conquered the darker-skinned Indian people and that they were a superior race so uh, that was the theory during uh, Hitler's lifetime. And as I said, uh, Hitler adopted the Indian symbol. Um, of course, neither Jainism nor Hinduism teach that, but that was the anthropological theory, theory of the period. And Hitler adopt the, uh, adopted the swastika in deference to that theory. And the uh, Hindu, the Indian swastika is actually very popular in India. There's multiple fabrics that have it printed and they bought, you can buy things. Um, I was careful not to buy anything with it because people can't tell the difference in the United States. They just think it's a swastika and that's what they see. They don't know the difference. So thank you, honey. That was good. Um, I had a question come up. So how do air and water liberate themselves? They would have to, uh, presumably they would have to end their existence as air or water and be born into a, um, so there's a self inside the air and the water. And when the air and the water are their existence in, um, and don't ask me how that happens, but uh, in Jane thought it does, and they would then be born as, a hu as an animal or a human being. And human beings are the only uh, state from which you can be liberated. You may be born as a human into a um, heavenly realm, but then you're a heavenly being and you don't have the opportunity for liberation there or in hell. It's only when you're reborn as a human that you have um, the ability to liberate. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. It's just, it's, it's, yeah. So this, this is a really important question when it comes to himsa and violence. So I understand that some Jains extend the dietary restrictions to foods like turnips and yams and other root vegetables. Um, could that be perceived as resembling animal flesh? Or do you have any comments on that? Also, I would add in there honey and alcohol could be mentioned in that. Alcohol, because alcohol is violent to the self. Um, honey, because honey is used to feed bees in the, the baby bees in the hive. And you're denying the, uh, the you're not hurting one individual bee, but you're, honey, you're hurting um, perhaps hundreds or thousands of bees in the beehive by harvesting the honey. Root vegetables, because you're digging in the earth and digging in the earth hurts the earth. Um, so that's root vegetables. And then things like watermelons and figs, because there are multiple living beings, each one of the seeds in a watermelon or a fig is a potential living being. And if you, um, if you disturb the watermelon or the fig, then, then you're uh, hurting multiple living beings. So yeah, it's not just vegetarianism. There's a, a whole, um, whole group of vegetables that um, Jane's uh, uh, don't eat. 
Well, and as we're talking about eating, are there certain rules about times of day you, you can eat? Yes, that's a good point. And, and that's a, a devout Jane will eat only before dark. And the reason they won't eat after dark is because um, of the possibility that a, a bug will fall into the food and you might accidentally consume the, uh, the bug with the, the vegetable food that you're eating. So, um, so that may answer a question. Somebody said, why are the claws over the mouth? That's, uh, again, that's because the air is a living being. Each um, molecule of air, if you will, is a living being. The, these living beings pervade the universe. Um, my, my mentor used to talk about, well, there's the, the not only is the uh, doorknob covered with living beings, but because the doorknob is material, it is also uh, contains living beings. And so um, they, but for the, the face covering, it's because they want to um, avoid harming the air, which is a living, which consists of many living beings. Which is kind of interesting. They've had this tradition for how many thousands of years before we knew that bacterium existed in the world. I think that's interesting. Yeah, at least, uh, at least 2,500 years, 2,600 years. Yeah. So... Um, somebody asked an interesting question and it's not one I've ever heard and I'm not sure there's an answer. The ring and index fingers on the hand are the same length. Does that have any significance in Jainism? You've got me. I'm stumped. <laughs> I do know that uh, I see Larry smiling. Um, I don't know if Larry knows. Um, has so, yeah, if somebody knows, let him pipe up. So, uh, Keith, if you, you ask the question, if you know, you can unmute yourself and share. I, I don't know the answer. What I do know that is in some Chinese religions, they measure the ratio between the index finger and, and, the, and the ring, ring finger. finger. And if they're shorter, longer, or the same length, they have something to do with the, uh, I don't know, your destiny. So I was uh, wondering... If because it was the same length, was there a significance in Jainism? I I honestly don't know. The hand is uh, uh, that you saw at the bottom of the. Uh, maybe that's what made you think of it. The hand that you saw at the bottom of the uh, the human body uh, in the hellish reason is uh, uh, again a, a universally adopted Jain symbol to say do no harm. So. Um, Sometimes they say live and, live and let live uh, as, the, as do no harm. So um, that's perhaps the um, uh, meaning of the hand. We did spend in one uh, uh, afternoon in Delhi, we did spend a great deal of time talking to somebody who said, again, that, that, um, that symbol that I showed you was the shape of the universe in Jane thought. So the, the uh, legs outstretched and the hands akimbo, I, you can't see me doing it, but the hands akimbo with uh, the uh, hands resting on the hips, um, that's, they believe is the actual shape of the universe. And we spent a good deal of time talking about, um, one man had a theory that, that um, so many light years we're in the head, and we kept arguing with him and saying, "No, the Earth is in, the universe is is infinite." And he kept saying, "No, it's um, it's only as big as our galaxy." And uh, uh, so they do believe that that it's that it's uh, actual universe is actually shaped like that. It's a, it's an interesting thing. So, um, how does Jainism fundamentally differ from Buddhism and Hinduism? That's an interesting question. Um, Jainism, Buddhism, and Hinduism as we know it today arose about the sixth century BCE. And this was a period of time when sacrifice, um, animal sacrifice was um, becoming less and less practiced. People were beginning to rebel at the notion of animal sacrifice. It also happens to be the time, about the period of time when the Hebrew prophets were beginning to um, 
you you read um, in in the Bible. You read, um, "I have not wanted your fatted cows and your um, your your animal sacrifices. Uh, I would I prefer justice and integrity to those." But in the Indian continent, Indian subcontinent, it's a time when Buddhism and Jainism and um, Hindu the Hinduism that we know today emerged out of the Vedic sacrifice system. So prior to 600 BCE, uh, cows and, and um, animals were still being sacrificed in India. And all three of these movements are a reaction to that. Hinduism replaced animal sacrifice with plant sacrifices. So if you go to a, a Hindu um, uh, ceremony, you'll see sacrifices and bananas and plants and ghee uh, clarified butter sacrificed on the sacrificial altar. Jainism and Buddhism both rejected the notion of sacrifice um, altogether. The main differences between Jainism and Buddhism, Buddhism uh, would say about Jainism that they're too austere, that their practices are too austere. And that's Buddhism was famous for having taken the middle path so they neither very austere nor very lax, but a uh, middle path of meditation uh, to reach uh, the same goals the Jains are trying to reach, which is an end of the cycle of suffering, birth and re uh, birth, suffering and, and uh, reincarnation, death and reincarnation. But Jains um, are much more austere. You don't see Buddhist monks um, that uh, have renounced clothing. You do uh, Jain monks. Yeah, you're good. So could you say, and I think this is important, I agree, and you might want to put the slide up there, I'm not sure. Could you say something more about the grand cycles of time in the Jain universe? Yeah, I don't actually have a slide for that. Oh, um, that's right, because it's it's huge. That's why there's 24 Tertankaras. Yeah, so yeah. there are 24 Tertankaras in this present cycle, and but the, the cycles of time go back infinitely far. And uh, for each cycle of time, for each, uh, I suppose there would be millions of years in a cycle of time, there would be a different 24 Tantankras. And this just repeats again and again and again and again until presumably all living beings have reached um, uh, and into samsara. And whether or not they actually uh, will all ever reach that Jains differ in their beliefs. Some believes that everybody will be saved in the end, and some believe that uh, there will be people who continue indefinitely uh, in the cycle of samsara. So this is an interesting question. How do you personally adhere to Jainism in your life here and now? The answer is I don't. <laughs> Well, uh, no, in all fairness, <laughs> uh, a Jain um, takes four, um, five householder vows, and uh, those are similar to the vows taken by the monastics. There, um, let me find them real quick. Well, you can say that, but did uh, studying Jainism have any effect on your life? How about if we put it that way? Yeah, let me let me again mention the five vows of nonviolence, truthfulness, non-theft, celibacy, and non-possessiveness. For Jain lay people, that celibacy would be faithfulness in marriage, and non-possessiveness would be uh, not the to the degree um, that. Um, monastic practice, the, the um, non-possessiveness. But in my own life, it's affected me um, in that I don't kill bugs uh, willingly anymore. Mm. If I see a spider, I'm more likely to um, shove it onto a piece of paper and take it outside than I am to kill it. Non-possessiveness, I think, um, and this just may be old age, but I, I've got enough clutter. I don't need more things. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I tend to think I practice that truthfulness, obviously. I try to be as truthful as possible. 
non theft, obviously, this is not something that I had to learn from Jane's. But, um, but yeah, my relationship to the natural world has changed. And I remember um, uh, for a period of time, uh, as I was studying Jainism, they, they have a, um, a specific type of meditation that they do. And when they do it, they very carefully lay out the cloth on which they're going to meditate so that they don't squash anything underneath the cloth. And then as they pick up the uh, mat or the, uh, the sheet is what I used, they would um, very carefully fold it so they didn't enclose any um, living beings in it. And I was happened to be living in um, a dorm when I was practicing this kind of meditation. I was doing it uh, as an anthropological experiment more than as a desire to become a Jain, but I wanted to experience Jainism as thoroughly as I could through their eyes and through their understanding. And I, as I did that, as I laid out the mat very carefully in my dorm room, and then as I pulled up the mat and folded it very carefully, I, it, the lonely, the very lonely dorm room didn't seem as lonely as it had before. It seemed like there were living beings there with me in that dorm room. And so it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience to sort of uh, experience um, the, the fact that life is all around us and uh, we're surrounded by, and for a Christian, which I am, um, I, I would argue that even if I don't believe that there are other souls in the sense that um, I'm a soul perhaps or, or have a soul, I nevertheless believe that they are made by God and because they are made by God, they're a reflection of, there's a reflection of the divine in them. Perhaps not the image of God that we say that humans have, but an image of God nonetheless because they're made um, by God and they reflect, reflect uh, her love for us and her um, love for them. And her the, the beauty of life is something that reflects her beauty. And so, um, yeah, that's how it's kind of impacted my life. Honey. Oh, nice answer. So one more. Do Janes have gods or goddesses? They do. Um, yeah. They have demons. And they Celestial have goodness. gods and goddesses, but the gods and goddesses are not omnipotent. Uh, they're not omniscient. Only the Tirtankaras, the liberated beings, are omniscient. Gods and goddesses are heavenly beings, and they are hoping one day to be born as a human being so that, um, so that they can uh, reach liberation themselves. Snuck in here. Ah, does non-possessiveness apply only to material objects or does it also embrace money? In other words, can one be a wealthy but live modestly? Oh, James. <laughs> this was the great um, uh, paradox that I met among the Janes. Janes are um, make up about 2% of the Indian population. And I think I try to remember the statistic. They pay over 50% of the taxes. So many chains are extremely wealthy. Uh, but they, if you talk to them, they'll say, well, um, I've set a limit. Some of them will say, I've set a limit on the number of buckets I have. They use buckets for bathing. And maybe I only need three buckets. And they, 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 like we would say, they give a lot of their income away to charities, mm -hmm. um, but they do accumulate a, a fair amount of money. And, um, and it's just a paradox you have to deal with. But the monks and the nuns um, have absolutely or very nearly nothing. And even what they have, um, they will tell you they borrow from the uh, from the lay community, so monks and nuns pr pr uh, practice absolute poverty, with only the the few possessions they have being borrowed from the lay community. Lay people, on the other hand, uh, set limits, but the limits can be extreme. 
um, but nevertheless, they set limits with the hope, uh, presumably, of reducing those limits as they get older and have taken care of their earthly responsibilities towards their families. So that's all the questions in chat. We need ah, a here's survey. another one, or Shadru one. Since James do not eat meat, is this why you see more paneer dishes? Yeah, paneer, yeah. The, the, um, there's an interesting thing about that, Urshad. Um, you should James, tell people what paneer is first, though. Paneer is basically cheese. It's a form, it's a kind of cheese. And they, if you talk to an Indian, Jane, they'll say, it's okay to drink milk and eat cheese because um, the cow gives that willingly. There's a movement in the United States and in Canada, however, because of the uh, corporate farming that we do and because of the fact that milk cows are often treated inhumanely, um, where many Janes are rebelling against drinking meat and eating cheese in the United States because of the, their, their perception that the um, animals are raised inhumanely. So, um, interesting. Do you think well, that- That's, a, um, that's a, a Jane temple in Simi Valley. Is there now? Yes, uh-huh. It's uh, in the same place where they have the Hindu society. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that I went to it. It's a small one, but the, the god and goddesses over there, they have really big eyes, I noticed. The, the, uh, it's interesting, both in Hindus and Buddhists and, um, or particularly Buddhists and Jains, you see the very elongated ears. These are auspicious marks. And I think probably uh, the perfection of the, of the uh, hand and what have you. These are very auspicious marks. Um, but um, Jains and Hindus often share a common mating place in the United States. Uh, and this is because um, the communities tend to be so small, particularly the Jain communities tend to be so small that um, uh, they, they can't afford to build their own buildings. There is one, however, I think it's in Buena Park where it's a, a completely Jain uh, temple. And, uh, but you do see both sects, they're sharing. You'll have the Digambaras on one floor and the Svetambaras on another floor. And they've cooperated. They, they don't always cooperate in India, but they've cooperated enough in the United States to build a temple together. And uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, I'll have to I'll have to see if I can make arrangements to visit the Simi Valley Temple once uh, once uh, COVID lifts. Uh, yes, there, I've, I've met a Jane um, at the senior center there as I was exiting one time. So, okay, so somebody, I just have to put this in there and there is no answer for it. It's because uh, it's in a way, it's how the cycle of life and, and thought works. So cheese is milk and that comes from cultured bacteria, right? So this is something they didn't know that since they've been using it and actually, a, obtaining the milk from a cow can be um, rather violent, but it's, they do it for, they think for the grace of the cow. And then the milk hangs in a bag and it cultures on its own without being disturbed. So it's, it's a complicated thing. There is no answer in this life for all of this. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is interesting. I have one uh, story I'd like you to tell, honey, as we finish, and then I'll put up the flyer for next time. And you'll put, up um, the, you'll put up the chat, the survey in the chat. Uh, I'll put up the survey in the chat box too. Or is that, sweetheart, um, do you remember Uma? Mm -hmm. And do you remember her grandchild? So I know what she's after. We were in a, we were in a, uh, I think it was Ladnoon, India. And um, the monsoons hit. And with the monsoons, all kinds of frogs appeared. And Uma was a, a, a sweet lady. Shugan and Uma were uh, really sweet Janes. And they had, they had their grandchild with them. And the, gra the grandchild went out and caught a frog and was carrying it around in his hand. And um, 
she, he went up to they they went up to take uh, in India they take the the dust off of people's feet. So that means you stoop down, you touch their feet, and that's a sign of respect to take the dust off of somebody's feet. So they were going up to the monastic to uh, take the dust off of his feet, and J Uma and uh, Shugan both bent down, touched his feet, and uh, said something nice to him. And then the little boy with the frog in his hand went up and touched the monastic on the feet with the frog in his hand. And as he walked away, I heard Uma say, let that frog go, you'll do murder. So, <laughs> starting at an early childhood, yes. It was, it was an interesting, um, valuable experience living with the Janes. So any other questions or comments? Okay, I am going to attempt to share the flyer for next time. Um, oh, I'm doing it from the uh, publisher. So next, on March 9th, we're not going to have one on February 20, uh, the last week in February. We are scheduled to do one March 9th. I would like you to notice that's a Tuesday. I didn't put it on the flyer. I need to correct that. Um, where do we come from? It's an interfaith panel will present their beliefs about individual existence prior to conception. And the moderator is going to be Rabbi Mike Lodker and the faiths represented and their speakers will be Buddhism, Scott Wilson, um, Church of Scientology, Wanda Beckstead, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will be Adam, Bishop Adam Basua, and then Trinitarian Christianity will be represented by Janice Dario, 